Hi, my name is Brian Volkowski, and I'm the CTO of the database company Aerospike. I'm here with Jeff Kelly, Principal Analyst of um, uh, Wikibon, and uh, with John Krisniak, the CTO of a company App Lovin. We're here to tell you to talk, to talk about big data use cases and how to choose the right tech stack for your app. So from Aerospike's perspective as a database company, we've been involved in the uh, we've been involved in the big data landscape for several years. Um, the ability to have a fast, higher performance database than any database previously has been critical to the success of a number of new industries. How do I change that? So what we found in the big data landscape is that in 2008, um, there was a big change in the advertising industry. So what happened was the choice in advertising of switching between content-based advertising to user-based content, uh, user-based advertising created a whole new tech stack and a whole new revolution. Uh, John today is part of that, and Jeff has been following this industry and the, the applicability of big data, the creation of real-time context throughout this entire period. So what we found is in Aerospike is this huge ecosystem of a wide variety of uses, a wide variety of companies attempting to use big data and use user profiles, especially to be able to enhance their businesses and enhance their applications. So the technology stack that is necessary is one that is more read-write and uses a lot of big data. At Aerospike, our perspective is that we see a technology where stack where um, the user's applications and user's context flows into back-end analytics. That's the batch analytics that you see on the right-hand side. And honestly, that means a huge amount of Hadoop. Hadoop has been an enabling technology for big data analysis. However, you need to go beyond big data analytics and into the area of actually using the big data insights online and live on your website, whether that's advertising optimization, retail optimizations, deals, uh, better billing, um, a number of different uh, great applications that um, both Jeff and John are going to talk to you about today. This new tech stack demands that you use an in-memory NoSQL system as your core database because you need a system that is simpler than the older models of having cache layer, database layer, and storage layer so that you can deal with more data, uh, more throughput, more, uh, with better uptime. So the kinds of new technologies that we've seen in this new scale-out architecture that were started in the advertising industry in 2007, 2008, used extensively inside Google, inside Yahoo, inside many of the larger companies, um, has now come out to the broader use cases, and we'll see here in 2014 a lot more NoSQL and big data in the different uh, systems, uh, and dri has, this has driven changes in the technology stacks of many companies. So, Jeff, John, uh, why don't you kick it off about the uh, uh, what, what you've been seeing in the, in the landscape? Sure, would be happy to. Thanks, Brian. So, again, this is Jeff Kelly with Wikibon, where I'm the uh, prin I'm principal analyst covering the big data market. Um, so today I wanted to talk about talk about a few things. Uh, I think Brian gave a great uh, great start to our presentation today around how Aerospike sees the market. I wanted to add to that and um, provide Wikibon's perspective on where we are in this uh, data management market, how we got here, um, and kind of where we see this going. Um, so if you're if you look at the screen now, you'll you'll see uh, it's clear to anyone. Uh, who, who's covering this market, who's paying attention to this market, that the data management market is in the midst of pretty significant change at the moment. Um, you only have to, you know, glance at the business press, the technology press, for evidence of this. Um, you know, some of the more glaring examples, of course, are Oracle, who's, you know, the, the dominant player in the relational database market, you know, is missing new database license revenue targets quarter after quarter, while, importantly, still generating massive cash flow um, through its lucrative maintenance contracts. Uh, but the new database license uh, revenue is, is uh, lagging. Um, then you've got companies like Teradata, a company that is essentially synonymous with the enterprise data warehouse. Um, you know, lost over $3 billion in market cap over the last year or so, uh, as many of its largest customers, top 50 customers, are reducing their spend uh, with the company. Uh, and then, of course, SAP, uh, which is trying to position HANA as the be-all, end-all in database technology with, with some limited success. Um, but really, what, what we see here is 
a traditional data management and database market uh, that is starting to stagnate a little bit. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing an explosion in some of the technologies that Brian mentioned, some of these big data technologies uh, and, and the communities that are developing around them. Um, if you've attended any of the Strata uh, Hadoop World shows or any of the other big data shows recently, uh, you certainly couldn't have missed uh, the sea of startups on the show floors. And the reason that there is a market and a demand for all of these different vendors in the big data space uh, is quite simply that enter enterprise practitioners are frustrated with the data management status quo. Um, you know, as one Wikibon practitioner said to us recently in, a, in an interview, uh, he said, quote, our data warehouse is like a snake swallowing a basketball. And, you know, we hear that kind of thing from practitioners all the time, not just in the data warehouse space, which is focused more on the analytics, but also in the relational database space as well. Um, so the question, of course, you know, what, what's really driving this frustration? And I think it's the, uh, to some extent, it's the traditional database, database business um, and some of the claims and promises made by the marketing departments of a lot of these vendors simply haven't lived up to uh, expectations. You know, promises like a 360-degree view of your customer, um, the ability to affordably scale deployments uh, as data volumes explode, agility to adapt applications and workloads as customer expectations uh, change rapidly. Um, you know, more specifically, we think there are three areas in particular uh, where practitioners are feeling uh, a bit frustrated and feeling the pinch. Uh, number one, of course, is around cost. Uh, you know, data volumes are growing exponentially year after year, uh, while IT budgets remain flat. So, you know, simple math dictates that the current data management paradigm uh, is simply unsustainable uh, from an economic standpoint. What we're seeing is enterprises being forced to devote more and more of their stagnant IT budgets to scale existing traditional database uh, and data management systems, leaving fewer funds to support innovation and value-add projects. Uh, number two area of frustration, of course, is performance. Traditional data management technologies are starting to buckle under the weight of big data, and this comes through uh, in conversation after conversation with members of the Wikibon community who make clear that as data volumes uh, and the complexity of analytic and database workloads increase, their relational database management systems uh, and related data management tools are unable, unable to provide the level of performance uh, required to meet these demanding business conditions. Uh, and third, but certainly not least, is agility. Um, in addition to performance, traditional data management approaches require, in many cases, lengthy data preparation, data modeling work, uh, making it virtually impossible for practitioners to adapt both analytic workloads as well as transactional applications at the pace required to keep up with end user expectations. And those end users could be customers, uh, could be partners, could be inside the organization, um, uh, employees within the enterprise. Uh, now, what's different today is that in years past, you know, practitioners had little option but to stick with these traditional approaches. Uh, but again, as Brian had uh, laid out a bit in the beginning of our presentation, you know, times have changed. And the question now, of course, is can big data live up to the hype? Sorry about that, guys. On the right slide now. Um, so what you're looking at here is Wikibon's uh, market forecast for big data. Uh, we were the first... Uh, research and advisory firm to uh, size and forecast this market, um, and this uh, takes us up through 2017. So as you'll see, uh, the market for big data products and services topped $18 billion in 2013. Uh, it's going to top $28 billion in 2014, uh, which we're quickly coming to the end of, and we expect the market to reach $50 billion plus by 2017. And of course, your next question, of course, is well, what makes up big data? So here's a little bit more of a, a little bit more granular uh, take uh, at the market forecast that we just presented. Um, as you'll notice, professional services is right at the top of that list in terms of the largest subsegment of the big data market. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, despite a lot of the promise of big data, things are still generally uh, this is still pretty complex stuff. Uh, not just the new technologies that are emerging, which we'll talk about more in a minute, but um, just the overall le level of integration that needs to take place between all these systems, um, as well as just some of the business use cases and, and some of the, what I might call, non-technical challenges associated with uh, adapting your organization to take advantage of big data. Things like empowering end users to make decisions, uh, just changing the culture from one of gut decision-making to uh, data-driven decision-making. So we're seeing professional services 
uh, playing a large role in helping enterprise practitioners uh, work through some of those areas. Of course, other big areas of the market, compute, storage, further down networking, the hardware component, um, despite the, you know, the fact that compared to some of the more traditional approaches of data management and database uh, deployment that requires either proprietary hardware, expensive appliances, um, you know, the big data space is predicated on scale-out approaches with commodity hardware, but nevertheless, you still need to, to purchase that hardware, and that's a significant segment of the market. Um, SQL technologies, even traditional data management technologies still play a role as well. Uh, and then you'll see at the bottom of this list, while small, the smallest components of the big data market, we think probably the most important uh, are Hadoop and NoSQL, which I want to talk a little bit more now. So kind of taking a, a step uh, in and looking specifically at the Hadoop and NoSQL spaces, um, this is our forecast uh, for those markets. And of course, important to remember, this is part of the larger big data market. Uh, in 2013, we uh, estimated revenues of $815 million in the Hadoop and NoSQL markets uh, relative to software and professional services. It does not include uh, hardware. Uh, we see this growing year over year, uh, reaching $3.3, $3.4 billion by 2017. Now, this is, these are relatively small segments of the larger big data market, but we think they are incredibly important because this is where we're seeing the majority of the innovation happening. Um, you know, the reason they're smaller, a number of, number of reasons, of course, they're younger, less mature markets, um, and we do think it's going to grow significantly over the next five to ten years. Uh, but also, you know, you have the sometimes complicating factor of a lot of this technology is open source, um, which, you know, we're seeing a lot of practitioners who are in the early phases using free open source software, um, especially in the Hadoop space. Uh, and, and that is one reason that these segments of the market are not quite as large as some of the others. So digging into the database space in particular, um, you know, a lot of this focused on the NoSQL space, to some, to some uh, degree the Hadoop space as well. Um, you know, we're seeing a number of alternatives uh, to traditional relational databases now available to practitioners. Um, you know, most, as I said, fall into this larger bucket of NoSQL, but there, of course, are many flavors of NoSQL, um, and they all have their particular uh, strengths and weaknesses and uh, workloads of which they're best suited to and, and uh, workloads that they're not so uh, well suited to. Um, you know, just on this slide, you'll just see a few of the different styles of NoSQL database, including key value stores, wide column stores, document databases, graph databases. Um, if you're looking outside of the NoSQL space, you've also got uh, the MPP analytic databases uh, to consider more for the large-scale batch analytics on structured data, but still um, a different approach than the traditional uh, enterprise data warehouse appliance. Um, and as I mentioned, each database has its particular strengths and weaknesses, and really there is, it is a challenge for a lot of practitioners in choosing the correct database uh, for your particular application and use cases. Um, and with that, that leads us to the next part of our presentation, which is a discussion with John from App11, where he's the CTO. Uh, John uh, Kristinak leads the engineering and develops mobile advertising technology that enables brands to acquire and re-engage customers on mobile. And he's going to talk to us today about how he makes some of these decisions and how he looks at the database market and applies it to his organization. So welcome, John. Thanks, Jeff. I'm just going to turn over the next slide here and just quickly describe to people who may not know why App11 is in this big data space and why we use different database technologies, including different models, the kind you talked about. So we're a marketing platform, which means we do user acquisition and retargeting on mobile. And mobile, of course, is a huge uh, area. We participate in various aspects of markets to see ad impressions from different sources, and the volume of that creates uh, such a large amount of data that flows off. And then with that data, you then have to apply analytics such as creative testing and performance optimization, machine learning type algorithms. And the three kind of major categories of databases that we have had experience with, that we looked around with at um, applying those different areas, analytic databases, kind of 
edge databases, storing user information. Uh, when we deal with advertising, we need to store a profile for every potential user, and that adds up to billions of users. And also, um, large-scale compute Hadoop-like environments, um, including Hadoop itself and also Spark. Um, just to get a sense of the scale, I was talking a little bit about what we do. Mainly, we have to figure out what the advertisers want, find the best users. That's where we use the edge database, engage those users over and over, and then we have to apply algorithms to figure out how to increase lifetime value, which is LTV. So this is called the funnel of marketing. Um, in a scale sense, the real problem that we have and that we see that relates to data is that we connect to real-time bidding marketplaces, and we process over 25 billion ad requests a day. That ends up peaking out, you know, in hundreds of thousands of seconds, hundreds of thousands of requests per second. So the entire system is a distributed uh, scale-out model system that can handle all these requests and then take all the data and put them to the right database. Um, it's a very important that any of the data that comes from any of the requests can go out to the database it needs to, whether that's the edge database, analytic database, or kind of the back-end compute farm. Um, and so with that, I guess I'll turn it back to Jeff, and we can talk about the section that we were going to do a little interview about the various decisions that we make in the process. Great. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think would would love you to dig into uh, in a little bit more detail kind of your current database environment um, and maybe expand a bit on why it is so critical to your business. You mentioned um, the need to connect to and feed into real-time bidding systems, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit on why the database is so kind of core to your business. Sure. Um, historically, the ad technology business have been kind of a volume business where you need to be a volume player to be significant. If you think of Google or Facebook or Twitter, Twitter or any of the major players, they're dealing with billions of impressions a day. So when we built our business, we needed to real, really figure out a way that we could affordably deal with that kind of data. The amount of data that billions of impressions and billions of ad requests and billions of users a month throw off is quite a lot. And when we started looking at this business, you know, obviously we had SQL databases around, and NoSQL was a very kind of new, immature possibility. Um, there were things like you discussed, document databases. There was columnar databases coming into the NoSQL world. And so we looked at all of these kind of database technologies and tried to say which ones are going to actually scale to be big enough to handle the mobile advertising world as it develops. Um, and the answer was that no single model of database was going to really be the answer for us because there are different use cases. And, you know, a transactional database or a SQL database is good at something, a columnar database or a NoSQL database is good at something else, and then everybody might need to put their data to a data warehouse or to a Hadoop and be able to process it that way. So one of the key decisions we made was to choose an architecture by which we could move the data to any of the databases. And at that point, once we had that architecture, it allowed us to plug and play with various database technologies. And we evaluated uh, many different NoSQL databases, different forms of Hadoop. We evaluated different analytic databases, and we ended up kind of refining and, and and using what worked at the time with the promise that as things got better, you could keep expanding. And the key to that, again, was the architecture that allowed us to be kind of database agnostic and not move data to where the data needed to be. Did that kind of cover what you're asking, Jeff? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, it sounds like it really, was really important that it not just, as you say, that the databases that you select not just fit the requirements that you had today, but, but as you said, you've got to look forward to the ability to scale and, and adapt to your uh, changing business requirements over time. Absolutely, because, first of all, I think in the time that we were looking, NoSQL was becoming an important thing and a very valid form for storing the kind of logging data that we would receive. Yet, the NoSQL landscape 
was not very mature, and no solution in 2011, for example, offered, you know, kind of all the parameters that you need in a fully working database system that would scale out and handle billions of requests and the read-write volume that, that Brian was referring to earlier. So what we were hoping was we would be able to refine and drill down and find the best solution. And I mean, I think that we thought about it in a couple categories um, in terms of kind of what's now called an edge database, which is where are we going to put the profile data for all our users such that we need to access it very quickly um, hundreds of millions of times a day or billions of times a day? And that means can we access the user data that we see for uh, that we see coming to us to make decisions on in under 10 milliseconds, in under 5 milliseconds, in under 1 millisecond, so very low latency access time. That is one type of thing that NoSQL looked like a promising uh, answer for, and we tried several things um, until we found Aerospike. We, we really couldn't get everything that we needed. Aerospike was a really unique kind of um, situation in that it offered us consistent performance at very low latency under high read-write mode. And that became kind of the go-to profile front-end um, or edge case, edge use database. Similarly, um, more on the analytics side, we looked at Hadoop and we had looked at different kind of warehouse analytics. And we looked at a variety of databases that would help us do, you know, the kind of data warehouse operations you need to do, which is aggregate a lot of data over time see time series behaviors. Um, we want to be able to not have the query. If, if you're doing a query that says, hey, show me all the data for the last seven days, it would be great if being able to do the last 30 days was also just as performant as a seven-day query. And that's where we looked at analytics tools um, and columnar databases. And the advantage there is that unlike a traditional SQL database, a columnar database stores data in a certain sorted order such that you can get back just the columns, just the data that you're looking for for a period of time based on the sort order. And you can arrange your, your tables and your projections such that you can basically scale very easily across time and across a large number of scale-up servers as you grow. So, so that became a category of databases that we looked at as well. Um, and eventually we looked at Vertica in that, in that category and started to use that. Okay, great. Yeah, I definitely want to dig into a little bit more about both of those, uh, both of those areas. But before we do that, maybe take a step back. Um, and I wonder, do you have kind of a general framework that you use or apply uh, when you're evaluating uh, you know, the database that you're going to use for a particular use case? Um, kind of a general framework that you can apply to either of those cases you just mentioned, perhaps. Uh, or basically, how do you go about making those uh, decisions? What are the evalu evaluation criteria uh, that you focus on? Right. I mean, and that's what the slide off is currently kind of about. And it's true for databases or any component, whether it would be your logging system or um, your front-end serving system, your, the way you do your networking. Um, and it, it, in a space where, you know, products are changing all the time and new categories are being invented, we, we decided that, you know, we did need a framework to decide because one day you might be looking at, you know, Cassandra, and the next day you might be looking at, you know, Couchbase or MongoDB. And not only are these in different slightly different categories, you might not know it at the time, but they have slightly different purpose. So you have to figure out, um, number one, we look at, even if this is a new product, you know, what are the proven use cases? Meaning, who, that, who is out there that is using this tool? And maybe they're not at the same scale we are. Maybe they're not in the same space that we are. But we need to see that, um, you know, you're looking at maybe an open source project, and maybe Facebook's developed it and has used it for its mail. And you need to say, okay, outside of Facebook, where's the expertise? Where are the tools that surround this product? Where's the support? And it turns out that potentially, you know, you might say, yeah, Facebook using it is good enough for us. 
it might turn out that Facebook actually developed this product and then decided not to use it for that same purpose. So you really do need that outside validation of the original um, use case. And that leads into once you have that, do you have developer momentum? Is there outside, are there outside developers who are willing to uh, contribute to the code, to support it, um, and to develop, you know, kind of additional enhancements to it? If the community doesn't have that uh, kind of momentum, the product is probably not going to last or it's not going to develop in the direction you need it to. And moreover, what you really want to do at that point is go out to those developers and talk to them about it and see are they using it, why are they using it, what, what are their plans for it, do they align with what you're doing. Um, on the chart here on the slide, I say driver fit. That's one of those things where you're getting more pragmatic about does this potentially fit into our environment? Uh, is this product written in C or C++ and are there drivers for it for the languages that we use? Or maybe the product was written in Java and you use Python and there's no Python driver. So that's very pragmatic, pragmatic considerations about how to think about the technology based on does it fit into your environment. And then kind of a more abstract consideration is if we do use this product, can we use it in more than one way to simplify our architecture? So um, an example of that is, you know, Aerospike's a good example of that, um, in that once you start using a product and you kind of get a sense of what it does, does it actually enable use cases beyond what you originally thought? That's a very important thing. Does it simplify our world? If it does, then you're saying, okay, well, there's headroom for this part. Maybe we start out using this as just a profile database, but potentially for our case, maybe we can use it as controlling our auction bidding algorithms later on. Maybe we don't push into that right away, but that's a very important consideration when we're thinking about components. And the last two, um, you know, are kind of a failure case. And, 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 and I think that when you're looking at new technology, you really have to expect most things will fail. How well is the technology um, integratable into your environment such that failures can be handled? So does it fail nicely? Has that been thought about? You get information about that from the previous users, and um, you really start to – what you're doing with these new products that you're looking at is you're hoping that you're on a path that – the product development is on a path that will lead you somewhere much better over the next year or two. So you might put up with a lot early on. Maybe fault tolerance isn't as good as it should be early on. Or maybe, you know, you have to do extreme things to back up your data. But, you know, you're hoping that three to five years down the line, all that kind of goes away, and you really do get to expand on the components that you're using. And that's how we kind of evaluated components in the NoSQL space, in the analytic data space, also in the large-scale data computation space in the Hadoop area. Interesting. So what I think would be really beneficial for the audience is if you could, if we could maybe apply this, uh, describe how you've applied this framework to uh, the two databases you mentioned earlier, Aerospike, uh, for the front edge database, and then maybe we could go into Vertica. But maybe let's start with Aerospike in terms of as you were evaluating front edge databases. Obviously, this is a critical component um, in your infrastructure, in your uh, data management world, uh, considering your business. Uh, maybe if you could walk us through how you applied these uh, six, the six-part framework to making that decision and, and tell us a little bit about how that went. Sure. I mean, one thing to think about at that time, um, this is a couple years ago, maybe all, almost three years ago now, most people were used to the idea of, hey, we're going to cache with a large memcache array. And in kind of the proven use cases, memcache had a lot of benefits. Um, however, memcache is really not a database. It's a memory store, you know, system. It has a downside of it. it's not very persistent. So we had been doing something similar to that using memcache, and we decided to look at different technologies. Um, one of the technologies we looked at was uh, Cassandra. One of the technologies was Couchbase. You know, there were other key value stores that are more like Tokyo cabinet. So we had we had to do a process where we looked at all of these different things. While we were we had already actually implemented Cassandra and we were having some issues with latency, 
And so we went around and I talked to some other CTOs at other um, technology companies. And I think it was um, someone from Blue Kai, who's a data management provider. And they said, you know, you should look at Aerospike because we're using it and we're, we do cookie matching, which is something very similar. So we had this kind of initial recommendation from someone that we knew was in our space that had a very proven use case or had very good things to say. The first thing that um, we did when we talked to the company was we asked them for three other customers we could talk to. So now I went and talked to three other customers, and in Aerospace's case, they had customers in our space. So I tried to talk to those guys. And everyone was very honest and laid out what, what was great about it and what was, you know, kind of the things you had to watch for. And after that process, I felt like we had, you know, built up the proven use cases. Um, now, Aerospike at the time was an open source product. So developer momentum was a little bit different. And there, the way that kind of we satisfied that was we actually met with Brian and Trini and the developers at Aerospike, and we had a good picture of their roadmap. Um, and that really kind of made a big difference, along with talking to the fact that the product was highly used in our space was very important. I talked a little bit about ViraFit. You know, Aerospike is a very performance-centric thing, and it's very C and C++ uh, compatible and oriented. And for us, originally, that, that was a little bit of a problem because we had, um, we had, back in those days, we had different Python and PHP code bases. Uh, we worked with them to make sure the drivers did work, but we've actually eventually migrated more toward the C and C++ model, and things are actually smoother than ever on that front. Um, now, here's where it gets hard in terms of, you know, you're going to make a decision. With Aerospike, of course, you're going to actually go and do a license or do a trial. Um, now you can do open source trial. So now you're getting into the commitment mode where you have to see not only what does this, does this work as they say it does in our environment, um, what are the problems, how does it fail, what are the fault tolerance modes, does it do replication, you know. Again, there you're looking for um, references from other customers, but now you're down to the nitty-gritty of actually testing it. And once we did all of that, we started to envision how, first of all, surprisingly, it worked surprisingly well. I mean, it really did what people said it would do. It was really fast. It was very consistent on performance. And compared to what we were used to, that was a very pleasant surprise. So now, over the next course, that probably took us three months to do this evaluation to the phase where we're actually using it um, in limited production. The, over the next year, as we like actually rolled out everything to it, that's when we started to see this point number four of, does this product really expand into other areas? Can we use it for different types of things? Um, as we did that, the product itself matured. As we're doing this, Aerospike announces that they have UDF and they have Lua as part of the, uh, you know, runtime inside the database so that now we can do calculations inside the database. And that enables us to do offload of some of the back-end calculations that might go in Hadoop. It allows us to do it in real time or at least pre-process data and allows us to push it into um, more of the edge case. What I'd say is, you know, in the Aerospike case, it was pretty straightforward. We had got a very good recommendation. We were able to talk to a bunch of different developers and businesses in our space that used it, thanks to Aerospike sales process giving us those referrals. Um, and we eventually ended up, you know, kind of being able to expand into it. And then I think, does that answer all the questions about the Aerospike one, Jeff? I think so, but I'd be curious uh, to hear a little bit about kind of the, the point five and six in your in your framework. Uh, you know, does it fail nicely in, in other platform risk? How did you look at that uh, in terms of evaluating uh, not just Aerospike, but generally when you were looking at edge edge based database options? Right. So, does it fail nicely? I mean, what does that mean? That that doesn't mean does it not fail because everything every database you lose hardware, you lose. Um, you could lose the whole data center. You know, we have to deal with replication. For us, we had to spend a lot of time figuring out ways to move our data there so that if an entire cluster went down, it wouldn't lose data. Um, the question of does it fail nicely is not 
you know, does the product never fail? It does this allow you to do a lot of work to make sure that when you do have an issue, um, you will be able to recover from it. And in general, uh, Aerospike definitely had those kinds of characteristics, although, you know, we spent a year probably architecting our system around it to move data around to make sure that data was, was getting replicated in different places. The Aerospike replication product also became better and more mature during that time. So whereas when you first start with something, you might have to, like I, like I referred to earlier, you might have to do complex things to have, ensure that you, you know, replicate your data more or keep copies of your data in other places, stuff like that, or take things offline once in a while. Um, we now don't have to do barely any of those things. So it, it you know, that's what does it fail nicely needs. Other platform risk is kind of a way of saying, are you depending on something in your environment that is an odd duck, that is outside of your regular expertise? If, for example, Aerospike was written in Erlang, um, for example, rather than Q, is written in Erlang, and it's a queuing system, it's a different kind of database product. But if you don't really have that knowledge or that expertise, and you don't have the time to develop it, it's hard to adopt a product that's written differently than what you're used to. And what, in our infrastructure, most things are C and C++ or in Java. So platform risk means does it run on the same kind of tools and the same kind of languages that we do. If there's a product that's out there that were based on C Sharp or .NET or heavily Microsoft oriented, and we're mainly a Linux shop, well, that's not going to work for us. Um, so platform risk, and finally, one other thing about platform risk you can think about is, you know, if you're a startup and you're thinking about working with partners or you're thinking about potentially being acquired, um, you know, would you want to commit to some kind of technology that you know would turn off potential partners or acquirers eventually? And so that's another element about platform risk that you have to think about is, you know, how does this, really it's a question, how does this fit into our overall architecture and where we're going? And that's, that's what we thought about with Aerospike and, um, you know, we had really good alignment on all those fronts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like, as you said earlier, it's really important to think ahead um, and think down the line how this, how it's going to fit uh, your needs, your use cases as you evolve. Um, that applies both to, to the to the features and the things you needed to do um, to move your business forward, but also some of the things around back and recovery and those those other features, those are more enterprise grade things that um, are, are really important to keeping your business online. Um, fantastic. So maybe let's let's shift gears to more of the analytic. Uh, database that you were looking at. You mentioned you've you've gone with Vertica, uh, but but walk us through that that uh, evaluation process. You mentioned you know there's a lot of options out on the market in terms of analytic databases. You've got the more traditional data warehouses. You've got new approaches like Hadoop. Um, of course, you've got uh, the MPP analytic databases such as Vertica. Why don't you walk us through that uh, decision making process and how you apply the framework in that case? Right. So you know. Again, one of the hardest things in this space is database technology takes a long time to build and get right. My, my sequel, if you think about it, is a 30-year-old product. Um, it's been around for a long time. And Oracle is, is up there, too. I mean, you know, so you're looking at, hey, how can we do analytic stuff? There are data warehouse model based on SQL. There are other tools you can buy. You can buy appliances. And we're still a startup. It's just, you know, we're still a startup, and we're trying to not spend, you know, millions or tens of millions of dollars building it. So you're looking around and saying, what's the general trend? And the trend has been, let's take, you know, a new technology like a columnar database or potentially like a Hadoop, and let's put more of our data in memory across nodes with a lot of good networking between them. And, um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the big challenges is that can I have my, my developers and my business users then have access to this data? So, you know, there are a lot of solutions now that are, that are pretty much, that are starting to be mature on the Hadoop side or the Spark side where you can put you know, a Hive or Impala or any of these types of, you know, SQL-like toppings on uh, a compute environment like Hadoop. 
At the time, there wasn't as many. So you would say to your developers, hey, if you want to do big data, if we have all these queries that we need to process over and over every day and, and we need maybe 50 nodes or 100 nodes to do them on, I'm going to want you to write, you know, PIG, which is a, a script. I'm going to want you to write Java or a MapReduce script to um, solve each problem that we're looking at. And what they would say to that is, yeah, that sounds really fun, but what you see on the business side is we're going to have a very slow output of query results. <laughs> they might run fast, but we won't be very flexible. Nobody knows how to do that. So one of the most, kind of that's a long way of saying we really wanted to find a SQL-compliant product that had scale-out tendencies. Um, as our data got bigger, as we went from handling hundreds of millions of requests to single-digit billions of requests to double-digit billions of requests, I just wanted to be able to buy more servers. So just in terms of looking at analytic databases, and there were a few choices out there, and including some open source choices that aren't Hadoop-based, there's something called Druid, which um, MetaMarkets, which is in our space, uses for analytics. And that's a, that's a pretty much an in-memory columnar model database as well. So there were some open source choices out there, and there were a variety of um, Hadoop situations where maybe there was some form of SQL coming available. Um, what we looked at when we looked at all these were you know, kind of how mature is this entire system? And not on this chart that you see in front of you on the slide was how fast can we turn around doing queries on this? Our business users and our team know SQL. If there's an answer for SQL that can scale, let's look at that. And so when we when we evaluated things, we did go through what you see in front of you. Um, any database that you care about, you know, these are important things when you're going to do things at scale. Availability, uh, replication, and fault tolerance. So those are obvious. I think I'm not going to spend too much time talking about why people want those, but in our system, we needed everything to be in multiple data centers up all of the time uh, and not lose any data. The next three things about memory, connections, performance, um, it became it, it became really important to us when we were looking at different databases as to what the resource usage was of each database and how many simultaneous connections in terms of writing or reading or any type of I.O. could the database handle, and could that really scale out. And what you run into in this space, uh, in, the, in the new databases, NoSQL and the common databases, is a lot of databases can scale out some, but can't keep going. And so back to my previous evaluation, when we looked at Vertica, we talked to um, their biggest users and some of the big users in our space that had deployments of 500 nodes and maybe, you know, a petabyte or more of data in Vertica. Um, one of them was Zynga. Zynga was one of the, was one of the largest Vertica uh, deployments around. So we talked to those guys. We talked with a bunch of other customers. We worked, and we did similar things with the other places in, in terms of looking at Hadoop. We talked with Cloudera. We talked with people that were developing Spark. Um, and we're trying to see if, you know, if we can go with Hadoop or Spark, we're avoiding basically paying a closed source license cost to Vertica. Um, so that was one other factor. But in the end, I'd say that really what we determined is Vertica was one of the unique things that gave you the full scale out ability with the compatible SQL. And yes, it did require a hard -like hardware license, but Compared to Spark and Hadoop and Impala and various types of Hive and those types of uh, analytic database solutions, they just were not ready in terms of usability at the point, at the time. And we actually did adopt them and use them for other jobs, but we knew that mainly for Vertica, the winning factor was it could do, it could do the analytics jobs we needed. It could run just like a database from our developer point of view and our business users could plug into it with Tableau or whatever else they needed. And now I would say that um, we've been using it for two years. We've scaled it out. It's in multiple data centers. You know, we have, I don't know, ten, hundreds of terabytes of, of data in it. You can look at it and now say, now maybe Hadoop and Spark actually are catching up to it. And maybe you could move some of what it does into those tools as well. 
But during this period where we were looking at it, it was pretty clear that on these database consideration fronts and on the previous slide in terms of what does the community think about it, where's the developer momentum, how will you maintain it in your environment, uh, Vertica was the analytic database of choice for us. Mm. Great. Well, you know, something that, that came to mind as you were as you were talking, especially you alluded to it as well in the uh, previous example of, of how you applied the framework. Um, it was one of the one of the six uh, criteria was you know does the database simplify your world? Um, can you talk a little bit about how that actually manifested itself in, in both of these cases? Um, and it sounds like you were able to in, almost uh, consolidate a layer. Uh, a database layer between these two databases um, in terms of simplifying your environment. Is that, is that accurate? And can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, it is accurate. Um, I would say that probably two years ago, we probably had eight different database products uh, MongoDB, Cassandra, Aerospike, you know, MySQL, um, Memcache, different types of things, key value stores, columnar databases running in our environment, we had queuing systems. I mean, it's just, you know, they're the, they're the lifeblood of dealing with data. You need to have them. And it's not like I said, hey, let's get fewer of these. But as the opportunity arose to um, put more work into either Aerospike or Vertica, we took that opportunity. So we, we probably did have to do some rewriting of our code and re-architecting in many cases so that we could move, instead of relying on, say, Mongo for a replication function, we would move that into Aerospike. Instead of relying on MySQL for a non-transactional database function, we could move that into Vertica. So the example there would be, you know, Vertica uses something called SQL 99, which is not 100% compatible with, say, MySQL. But if we wanted to move some function into Vertica, and we tested it, and certain things were not great. Like certain things, you don't want to do rapid updates in Vertica. It's a columnar database, and it won't accept those very fast. But for reading for certain tables, it was perfectly good. And we can actually eliminate certain MySQL databases by using Vertica. So that was a case of here's where we're going to consolidate. And we actually, um, I would say, went from probably eight major database products in our environment to about three. So it was important, and it, it simplifies everyone's job because, like I say, if you can imagine, you just have to imagine that database is just a, are going to fail. And so if there's eight different ways of failing, you have a very tough ops life. If there's two or three and you work with the same people, whether it's the Airspike support or the Vertica support or whoever you're working with, um, you really are simplifying, you know, the time and energy that you're spending on dealing with whatever problem the database creates. So uh, that's really the benefit for us. It does simplify our environment. And, and, you know, once you become comfortable with tech, I think you become comfortable with technology, the technology has matured and it's proven for you, that's where you start to push the envelope and say, hey, maybe we don't need memcache anymore. Maybe we'll just put all of that in Aerospike. Um, mm -hmm. Next time you, somebody thinks of a new business product, you think, hey, let's just throw up some Aerospike servers and test that. So that's how that evolved, and that's still true to this day. Um, and then out the other side of that, you do want to be on the lookout for new technologies, which could maybe subsume some of what Vertica or what Aerospike is doing. We, you know, yeah, we that was going to be my next question. Is, is you know, certainly, again, in your in your business in particular, you know, it's critical that you're kind of on the cutting edge in terms of the database technology you're you're working with. How often do you reevaluate re kind of your database environment? Um, is that an ongoing process where you always get your eyes open, or do you do you make it a point to reevaluate every six months, every year, longer periods? How do you look at reevaluation of your database? Yeah, I'd say it is an ongoing process, but at the end of every year, we do want to think about you know. One thing is, if you sign contracts for licenses, you know, you think about it at that cycle. Um, you might need to buy more licenses. At the end, by ne you know, for next year, I might need to expand my license. Now I'm thinking, hey, if I'm buying a big uh, vertical license, is there some, you know, kind of more cost-effective approach in Spark? Um, so that's one way that you do reevaluate it. You do look at it kind of annually, and it coincides with, boy, 
do I really want to, you know, kind of keep expanding my license cost here? Um, and the other thing that you do is, like I said, new projects come up. And, you know, one thing that's exciting for your engineering team and your ops team is to be exploring new technologies. So we do want to be looking at new technologies. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, we have built a large Spark cluster, and we do use it for machine learning. And we've been trying to find opportunities to use it. Sometimes I feel like my engineering team has become pretty, you know, satisfied, complacent with, hey, I can use SQL all the time, or I can use, you know, a profile database all the time, rather than kind of moving yet to the Spark world. And what that really says is Spark and Hadoop still, you know, don't have all of the tools connected up as easily as possible as, say, Vertica, which has been a product for eight or nine years. So um, those are the processes that happen to us. And, and you know, one other thing I, I, I say, ask a question back to you on your slide in terms of projecting cost, you know, or the size of the market. I think one thing that gets underlooked on any kind of big data solution is networking cost. Um, you know, because what we see is when you're looking at Hadoop or Spark or Vertica or any kind of compute cluster, networking costs, you tend to have to spend on the most proprietary, highest expensive networking. And maybe in the future that will change with more virtual networking and solutions. But um, those seem to be a very big factor for us in terms of, you know, kind of these different database things. Yeah, really good point. I think it's, you know, an area maybe that sometimes tends to get overlooked. Um, so we're coming up close on time, so I, I wanted to ask kind of one final question, um, and, and that would be kind of a big-picture question, but, but how do you look at this? Um, and your database environment and your database requirements are obviously pretty high because of the business that you're in. Um, how is some of the things that you presented today that you've talked about how you consider and evaluate database technology and how central it is to your business, do you think this applies to other um, other industries, other vertical markets and use cases? Um, can others who are not necessarily in, in this business take advantage of some of these capabilities and, and the way you're looking at the market and, and the database technology available? Um, I mean, I absolutely think that the, the framework model does apply and that depending on your business, you know, maybe you have a business which isn't pushing the envelope, which is maybe more cost containment structure or something like that. Um, you definitely would want to use, you know, write down some kind of model for how you think about next new technology. That's what, you know, I'm a CTO. That's what we spend most of our time doing, and other CTOs think about, you know, how do we adjust our architecture to better match what's fitting the business. Um, at, you know, I think the most exciting thing about having the framework is that then you can drive technology improvement that you know has an impact on the business rather than just saying, hey, let's try a new technology. And honestly, in the database space, I think things have kind of calmed down and become more mature in the initial days of the new NoSQL world, where it was definitely a world where every day or every week someone was saying, hey, let's try this database. Hey, let's look at this thing. And if you don't have some kind of like, you know, just, just to tell your engineers, here's how we approach that and here's how much work that is and here's the things why we consider um, looking at a new database or changing, um, then you're going to basically be running around with, you know, like a chicken with his head cut off, looking at every potential product. So in any business, absolutely, the CTO, the IT leaders, the technical people need to have a framework for thinking, you know, what am I looking at? How am I going to evaluate it? When do I know that I want to make a commitment to this new technology? I think that really helps. Great. Well, some really good insight and some good advice uh, for our audience today. John, thanks so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. I think this was really informative. Um, gives people a lot to think about uh, in terms of evaluating their database environment. Uh, with that, I will turn things back over to Brian from Aerospike. Hey guys, John, Jeff, John, thanks very much for a really informative and interesting discussion. I mean, it's it's great to have true practitioners out there uh, who have seen these various databases and are implementing really exciting strategies in uh, their applications. Uh, AppLevin's platform and how they do analysis of the different applications in a mobile environment I think is pretty exciting and cutting edge. And here at Aerospike, we're pretty happy to be part of uh, John and his company's success. So thank you guys both for a wonderful webinar, and um, that'll wrap it up. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks, Brian.
এখন 